Welcome to How I Grew My Practice, the podcast where health professionals share the behind the scenes stories of how they built a thriving practice. Each episode will uncover surprising challenges, victories, and life lessons learned throughout their journeys. Let's get started. Welcome to How I Grew My Practice, a podcast presented by Next Health. I'm your host, Alec Goldman. In this episode, we have Dan Romari, Chief Information and Analytics Officer from North American Dental Group, here to talk about how to build a data-driven DSO. Dan, how are you doing? Good. Great to see you, Alec. As always, happy Friday. Happy Friday. Um, Dan, just for the folks in our audience who may not know who you are, if you could share a little bit about who you are, what you're up to at North American, and how did you end up in this role? Sure, I appreciate that. Yeah, briefly. So I'm Dan Romary. I'm the CIO and analytics officer here at the North American Dental Group. I actually just celebrated my three-year work anniversary yesterday. So I've been here in dental for three years now. Prior to that, I actually worked for a number of companies and industries, primarily focused on high-tech data integration engineering, trying to basically build bridges and connect dots between different concepts, departments, things like that to provide Actionable, out, actionable outcomes using data, analytics, and just kind of bringing together all of the teams. So what really brought me into dental was coming from high tech. As we came through the COVID, I found that, you know, the industry was a little bit sort of shy on things that were sort of cutting edge and bleeding edge and kind of pulled back on a lot of the types of projects that I was working on, in which I was managing things like AI and platforms and developing those types of projects. So even some of the largest companies in manufacturing, distribution, logistics, once the COVID hit, they kind of pulled back some of their investments, which opened my mind to something that was a little bit more stable. I think about healthcare, I think about dentistry, which is an industry which is always going to be there as long as people have teeth. Uh, and it's also an industry that I think is ripe for you know, innovation and opportunities for things like uh, you know, the types of principles and concepts that I've been working on throughout my career. Dan, so you know, being data-driven feels it's a very buzzwordy term. But you have a really interesting background on predictive analytics. Would you mind just sharing with the audience a little bit about that? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So predictive analytics and just kind of data in general is something I'm extremely passionate about. So starting my career around a couple of decades ago, just kind of dating myself, I worked in uh, I was working in retail and sort of working on that customer loyalty card program, doing customer skin models, sort of propensity models, marketing models, email, you know, mark target market campaign models. This is before the concept of even BI, business intelligence, and a lot of platforms that we're using now. But we were using kind of old-fashioned regression and sort of just basically data integration, pulling together data from a lot of different environments. I progressed from that role to a number of other industries, retail, publishing, and a couple of other industries, using the same principles of sort of pulling together massive amounts of data, developing different types of models different, based on behavior, based on you know, what we're trying to enact and affect for our customers. And using that in, in, uh, in dentistry is also something that is not quite as common as I thought it was because, you know, patients have needs and they, they have various sort of characteristics and things like that and kind of helping to understand that's important. That said, I'm also, as I mentioned, I'm very passionate about data. My, my background is actually as an engineer, sort of a data engineer doing data processing, predictive analytics and things like that. Um, unlike most CIOs who are typically come from sort of that infrastructure and kind of network side. Um, I try to bring a little bit more of that strategic alignment based on sort of uh, clinical innovation in our practices. In my spare time, up until recently, for about the past 10 years or so, I was also an adjunct professor teaching sort of um, big data concepts, data lakes, and more importantly, you know, predictive analytics and statistics on basically bringing data together. And the one message that I try to bring to my students, whether they're undergrads or master's students, is really kind of the principle of kind of keep it simple. If it's not relatable, if it's not explainable, if it's not actionable, then it's just entertainment and, you know, people get entertained by all of the really awesome tools out there, you know, from R and Python and all of these other things that have great colorful color coded maps and things like that. But if it's not something that I could explain to an executive, a stakeholder, a peer in a very simple way, then they're always going to reject it. They're always going to question it. They're always going to think that it just doesn't make sense or it's too complex to make actionable. You know, we always have to realize that there's a human element to this. And when we're dealing with, you know, patients, we're dealing with dentists, doctors, providers, hygienists, we can't sort of paint the world in data because people become lost and obscured and they feel like they lose that sort of human touch, that human element. And when I think about data, the other thing I was going to say is, you know, in terms of data presentation, you know, dashboard prediction, what we're really talking about here at the end of the day is communication. We're trying to communicate an idea, communicate a concept, pull together different sort of you know, nuggets and gold nuggets and kind of build a bridge between something that we, we may have hypothesized that we were trying to prove or disprove. 
And that really, in, in a nutshell, comes down to communications in terms of showing people, you know, what the data is telling us and kind of where the, where the opportunities lie. So that's really kind of how I think about it. You know, if, if I was going to have a mantra, it would be kind of keep it simple and explainable. And also, you know, maximize effective communication anytime we're talking about data. Um, also, I think of um, AI has been in the news, you know, for the past decade or so, much more realistically now that we have like ChatGPT4, all of the different chatbots, which are completely amazing. Also in healthcare and medical, it's also becoming extremely um, prominent as well. Um, so as we kind of think about all of the advances, it's that much more important to make sure that we're not obscuring this behind sort of a veil of obscurity, that we have the ability to say, yes, we understand it. We know what it can do. It is something that was developed by people and should be explainable by people. You know, whatever type of input we're putting in there should be explainable on the other side. And that's really kind of the approach I've always taken. As I've developed product managed AI solutions and things like that, I've always tried to keep it very succinct and explainable so that people actually use it. Because if it's not explainable, people will always question it. Yeah, there's obviously the concept of uh, there's data, there's information, and then there's knowledge and wisdom. And being able to climb that hierarchy and sharing that wisdom and knowledge across an organization is, I think, the difference between uh, folks who are just looking at data and actually communicating and making change within organizations. That's a great point, too. And I'll, I'll just I'll echo that sentiment, by the way, and saying, you know, when we think about that knowledge and wisdom piece, that's where our experts come in. That's why when we when I build any type of model or any type of analytics type of project, I'm always partnered with a dentist who's an expert in that particular field or a great office manager who really understands patient communication relationships or a hygienist who really kind of understands how we're connecting the dots between the AI algorithms. So I think that, you know, as we think about communications, I think what you said is extremely important about sort of bringing that expert level of sort of wisdom to help drive what the strategy is. Data for the sake of data is, is always a non-starter. So obviously you have a massive background on uh, being, you know, uh, predictive analytics data. What was kind of the mission or what were the problems that you were solving when you were joining North American Dental? How has that kind of changed the organization, you know, you being in the role that you are? You know, that's a really great question. I think that I came to North American Dental Group right about the right time. You know, I think that I'm fortunate to be surrounded by really smart, insightful leaders. And our leaders have vast amounts of experience in dental. And a lot of the types of decision making that they were making was based on their experience, their instincts, you know, their gut. Uh, and I think that what I tried to bring to solve some of the challenges they had was to have an open mind in terms of thinking out of the box with how we use, you know, data analytics and reporting to help to sort of bridge the gaps between their hypotheses, what they think is going on in the field with what's actually happening. The other thing that happened in the past few years whenever I came on was, um, you know, we're coming out of COVID. This is a completely unprecedented time in terms of understanding the human nature in the business and understanding how people's behavior has changed. We basically took a solid year where people effectively weren't allowed to go to the dentist or go to a doctor or go anywhere unless they had an emergency. Uh, we were shutting down practices because of the COVID, just like everybody else was. And what we saw was, you know, massive amounts of attrition and we saw delays and patients coming back to their scheduled appointments. Maybe they were realizing that they didn't need to go for their hygiene checkup every every six months or every three months or whatever it was. Maybe they're realizing that they could do without it. And it was these types of challenges as we kind of thought out of the COVID that we said, hey, there's a lot of questions that we just don't understand about the business. But how does our expansion, the Novo mergers and acquisition strategy change based on getting into different territories where we see different types of behavior? So being able to kind of attack some of those really big challenges and just in terms of what we're talking about is, you know, human nature and behavior, which has changed and has been completely unpredictable and unprecedented. Um, helping to try to use data to tell those stories and connect the dots, I think was probably one of the main challenges or one main focus that, that we had whenever I came on board. And also an exciting one at that, because, you know, even though I look at data all, all day, I also, you know, uh, am, a, in a, am a patient and I have a family and people that go see the dentist and their propensity to being outside the house without a mask and all of the other elements, uh, it, it changed the way people behave. So I can certainly relate to that. Yeah. So given that you are responsible for overseeing hundreds of locations uh, across, uh, across the country, being data-driven means tracking each point of the patient experience. So certainly, you know, an inevitable question is, you know, when we're talking about a topic as broad as making a data driven DSO, you know, can you share about what are the key metrics that you're that you're tracking? What does it actually mean for a DSO to be data driven? Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. So I, I think, you know, one of the things that I think about in terms of being data driven is I, I always talk about data driven culture of informed decision making. 
which basically says that, you know, if we're going to try to affect change in any area, we have to have kind of data to back it. So we, we have some really strong data analytics. I would say it's probably beyond what most companies are doing in dental. I've talked to a lot of the, the data BI integrator companies, and I think we've learned a lot from those folks, but we're doing something different because I'm trying to apply the same principles that I've learned from previous roles. So to be more specific, um, one KPI that, I've, that we implemented in the past, a couple of years ago, uh, is called the concept of the high watermark, which I'll share with you in just a moment. But just to provide the background of what the high watermark is, coming right out of COVID, where we had all of these budgets and we had all these expectations for the business based on the number of appointments, the number of patients we're going to see, the amount of, you know, the, the amount of um, uh, comp that we're going to basically realize, all the different key metrics in the business that most DSOs sort of revolve around. We basically had a series of budgets that were, ba that were forecast based on the past three years of learning, based on, you know, all of the learnings we had. Once COVID really hit, a lot of those budget numbers really sort of went out the window. And the practices, the office managers, our operations team really struggled to try to understand what was happening and how to even manage the business. Effectively, I think what they did was they sort of like kind of threw away, um, they, they, they sort of uh, threw away the, uh, what, what they were, what, what their old playbook, which was, um, let me let me share this real quick. I'll just share this on my screen. Sure. They kind of threw away the old playbook because it it, it made no sense anymore. It, it just didn't, it no longer applied. Let me just share this real quick. So what I'm showing you right now is the concept of the high watermark. This basically says that if I was going to look on a calendar at the, the number of the amount of revenue I'm expecting, the number of appointments, uh, the um, amount of other behavior like no-show rates, capacity, confirmation rates, and things like that. Um, comparing to a budget made no more sense. And the teams and operations basically just threw away the budget. So I came up with this concept called the high watermark, which basically says, if you look at the chart at the bottom here, I'm just going to take a, I'm going to take a metric here. I'll split this. This is, this is the number of completed appointments. So the, the concept came from, you know, I was scratching my head one day, like a lot of people, you know, after the holidays, I was scratching my head trying to figure out how to get myself, you know, to do the behavior that is desirable. I was trying to get myself back to the gym, back to doing the things I should be doing. I'm saying if I could only do what I did, you know, during the, you know, that third month of March when I was just killing it, that would be great. Rather than compare myself to some false idea of something that's not realistic in a book or in a pamphlet, I said, well, if I could just be the, the best that I can, I will be superseding myself. And if I can achieve past that, that would even be better. So this is taking the concept of completed appointments. Again, this is data is completely obscure. It's coming from our development environment. And this dotted line here at the bottom here basically says, this is your high watermark for completed, completed appointments on a 12 month rolling basis. So we eliminate seasonality. We eliminate anything that happened more than a year ago. And we're just saying, we're not asking anybody to compare themselves to a, a budget, which may or may not make sense. We're just asking you to compare yourself to your best possible behavior ever. And that's basically what this does. So if you look here, we can see that, you know, we, we have this sort of color coded percentile um, idea of the, the number of complete appointments in this sort of dummy area. Um, and in this case, we hit that high water mark a few weeks ago, back in the beginning of July. Right. And before that, we actually had a high water mark in the middle of April, as we can see here at 6.9. So as we sort of progressed that, we redefined a new standard. We basically raised the bar and that became the new high water mark. So the chart at the top here basically says, at what percentage of the high water mark are we? How far, how far are we in terms of deviation from that particular high water mark? And taking that principle and using that for, um, you know, our reserve and backfill rate to effectively, you know, double book appointments, capacity rate, how much utilization we're seeing. What's our no-show rate that we're trying to decrease? And then the number of confirmations. That helped the practices to make much more actionable things that were much more obscure before. And effectively, they just threw it away and said, well, we're just going to go to work and do what we've always been doing anyway because we don't really see how we would ever compare to a, a budget that literally has become meaningless. So I think that's an important one. Um, that, that's something that, that you know we, we try to be extremely mindful of. Um, and any questions on that, by the way, um, Alec, before I jump to the next idea? Yeah, I mean, I I know you've mentioned this to me in the past, this concept of the high watermark. Um, and I think it, you know, at its core, it's almost like you should not compare yourself to anyone else. Just compare yourself to who you are right now and how can you make a very actionable difference to getting to a state that's better than where you currently are. So I think sure. it is extremely helpful from, you know, knowing all the variables in your own life. 
Um, and then saying, well, what can I, do? what are the five things I could do right now to try and reach that state? What was I doing on that specific day that allowed for me to get there? So I guess the question that I would then throw back to you is if you're seeing that your high watermark on completed appointments is 650 and you're at a current day where it's at 450, what are some questions that you and the team are asking yourselves? That, that's, 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 that's the question, by the way. So when I think of, I try to always empathize with anybody who we're creating a solution for, whether that's an a extremely busy, overworked office manager who has to deal with customers on a daily basis, some of them happy, some of them rude, some of them not happy, or an operations manager who's trying to juggle dozens of practices at a time. I try to put myself in their position and say, look, if I was in their shoes and I had a million things to do today, I don't want to have to worry about one more thing. I, if anything, I want my life to be easier. I don't have to worry about how to sort of hit some imaginary budget number. So to answer your question, the great, the great question is, how do we get from 450 to 600? And the idea is, hey, if I look at my high watermark week, you know, and this is, <laughs> this is my um, Apple watch with the, you know, the number of steps I take every day. I just say, what was it that I was doing three months ago that allowed me to do that? What was it at the practice that allowed us to achieve that? Was it that we had an extra office manager to help support? Do we have to make phone calls? Do we have an extra hygienist to help sort of open up another slot? Do we have an extra provider? And what's different about it, the, the situation now? Did, did we lose something? Did something change in the industry? Did, you know, did my um, top hygien hygienist get sick? Um, so those, you know, or did my doctor go on vacation? Like, so these are the questions. And some of the questions are, and some of the answers to that are very trivial. Like, it's just like, oh, yeah, well, that week we did this promotion. It was a, you know, come in and get a free quick toothbrush or something. You know, and I was like, oh, well, <laughs> let's do that again. <laughs> you know, and uh, but that's the thing. It's like, what was the environment like to allow for that level of productivity? And how can we sort of try to emulate that and support it? We're not looking to do anything that's not sustainable. We don't want to say like, well, you guys crushed it out of the park because we had all of these incentives and, you know, double day extra bonuses and all the push things out. We're just saying we just want you to be your best self. And you've done it before, so like, let's try to do it again. I think it's so great. Um, I mean, essentially what it really looks like is that you're creating a mirror, not just for an individual or an individual practice, but for an entire organization of hundreds of, of practices across the country. Exactly. And, and, you know, just echoing my earlier sentiment, like there's nothing complex about this. It, it, there's no prediction. There's no regression. There's no forecast. There's no prescriptive analytics that tells you what to do. It's literally, I think that the effectiveness is in its simplicity, right? Because we're just saying, like, we want you to be your best self, and we can show you what that looked like. Right. <laughs> and that's basically, that's basically the message. And I think that as I've sort of deep dived into all of the, bringing together all of the variables from every single data source, and every, you know, we're at DSO, so we're reliant on dozens of, of data platforms and platforms to run our organization. Everything from online scheduling, next help online billing, uh, open accounts receivable statements. We have dozens and dozens of platforms. Every platform, I work with the engineering teams and I sit down and we find a way to build an API. And then we do the integration and figure out how to connect the dots between practices, providers, patients, and everything like that. And it's that simple. It's really sort of just based on bringing the, the data together. Ultra simple approach. Again, simply, you know, high watermark just says, everybody who has ever had, had an Apple Watch and try to, you know, get their 10,000 steps in, figuring out what they did last Tuesday. Like it's a great, uh, it's a great exercise and people relate to it a lot. So let me play that back just quickly. So it sounds like what you're doing is making sure that you are standardizing the technology decisions across all of the practices for solutions. Again, online booking for next health, it may be payments, reviews, um, reminders, ensuring that they're all using the same thing and then having all of that information plug into a centralized system. Exactly. It's exactly right. Enterprise data warehouse. And then that way we can develop different types of outputs, analytics reports, ad hoc reports, connected workbooks, things like that. Exactly. But the integration is really kind of where the value is, in my opinion. And that's been the same principle that I've always had since, you know, I started my career decades ago when we were doing, you know, customer skin models, customer loyalty. And, you know, it, the, the the principles are very similar. If I, if I sort of pivot to the, to the kind of the next concept real quick, because that's sort of I think that kind of opens up the, the idea another concept that we're that we're extremely focused on is um something that we something that we think of as um let me see just let me see let me just see if i can share my screen real quick um so the con so going to the high watermark the, the idea is if i was going to try to attack another important problem it's no-show rates so most dso's have a no-show rate that 
you know, sort of ranges from 15% to 20% to 25% across the board. And you think about a no-show rate. These are people who don't show up for their appointments or they cancel the day of within 24 hours. And what we're basically saying is, I had an appointment, I got a reminder, I, I confirmed or I didn't confirm, I didn't show up. So what you have is an open operatory, you have a dentist, you have a hygienist, you have maybe a, a dental assistant who basically is now idle. Unlike, you know, what we think about is like retail, where, you know, you open the door, the more people that come in, the better we're selling something. This is a very specialized service that we're providing. So we reserve that chair for people. So for every patient that doesn't show up, obviously it costs resources, energy, effort, right? It's, it, they're very expensive. So just kind of looking at this screen, this is a list of the appointments for the day. Again, dummy data, looking at sort of our, our, our uh, sandbox environment. And we created an algorithm. Basically, it's a no-show score. It's a rating based on the propensity for patients to not show up. And what that means is we know a lot of information about our patients, and we can start to think through how to use that information to kind of create a predictor of, of those that are more likely than less to not show up. So, of course, being kind of a, a, a statistician, data junkie, the first step I took was to take every single you know, piece of information that I know about our patients, whether it be you know, the proximity, the distance from the practice that they live, you know, are people in that community more likely to take public transportation? Um, are there other factors, you know, how many households potentially have families versus single versus married? Anything that could kind of give me a tell in terms of predicting human behavior. What's the, you know, what's the relative you know, market demographic in that area? I pulled together literally dozens of variables to try to create a predictive analytics score. And what happened was, <clears throat> to, my, <laughs> to my good fortune, two factors bubbled up to the top that were accountable for over 90% of the predictive power strength of my predictor. And they were whether the patient confirmed their appointment and what was their historical no-show rate. That's it. That's all I needed to know to create sort of a, a to create a score. So in this case, we can see here this this dummy patient potentially missed 50% of their 12 past appointments, didn't confirm. So therefore, we say that they are a five, which is the top level of person that could be, you know, that would not show up for their appointment. If I was taking those odds to Vegas and I knew that this person pro had a very high propensity not to show up, I would probably be able to make a bet and be right. So we introduced this, keeping it simple. The beauty of it is I'm not showing them AI, a black box, 27 variables that went into determining this. I'm showing them two things that they are tangibly seeing. So the first thing that people asked was, well, I don't know if the 50% is true. You know, I just saw Mr. Jenkins last week, and you know, he typically shows up for his appointments. I said, okay, well, if we drill into that particular patient, here's exactly what they did over the last year or throughout the history of us knowing that person. We, here's the status of every appointment they had. They missed their appointment. They broke it. They canceled within 24 hours. They said, okay, that's fine, but you know, I'm still not comfortable with you know, potentially double booking or putting somebody into a, you know, a backup slot you know, like they do on, on airlines and things like that. Because what if Mr. Jenkins shows up after all? I said, well, he may show up, but we also know that based on our historical trending, this is, again, dummy data. This is, this is not looking across the yep. track, but we just, but, but these, these numbers have been consistently accurate just based on our algorithm. So this is, this is our own algorithms anyway. We basically know that looking at those factors, based on that one to five scale ranking, that that particular patient who's a five is probably two thirds likely to not show up for that appointment. So we had to kind of play it back to the office managers and the teams to sort of, you know, inform them that, you know, by keeping it simple, by sort of having a way to sort of predict more or less likely who may not show up, we can actually have a powerful tool in sort of navigating those no-show rates, confirmations, and kind of affecting the type of uh, change that we want. And if we can kind of leverage, you know, in some cases, backfilling appointments or, or you know, double booking that appointment, and we can manage it because we have multiple providers. At least we have some strategy around which patients have that higher propensity to not show up. Yeah, I think it's incredible. I mean, what you're effectively doing is treating uh, your seats at your practices more or less like hotel rooms or airline seats. Right. And at any point during the, either of those discussions, did I talk about um, logistic regression or AI or black box? <laughs> so, no, that's simple. You know, you right, exactly. The two variables after, I mean, you obviously did your homework and your analysis, but that's right. We did the homework first. Yeah, that's right. and that's a good point. Like we did the analysis first, we did the homework first, and it proved that we can that we have things that are very actionable. Human nature is not extraordinarily complicated. 
And so we want to try to keep it simple just to say like, these, you know, if somebody just doesn't show up for their appointments, then it's not a value to them. We can at least tell them who those folks are. Yeah. So obviously having that type of reporting um, is, I would say it's invaluable. Um, but you mentioned earlier in the show that lots of dental service organizations may not have something like this. I wanted to ask you, you know, what are the challenges that you think DSOs are facing to implement more of a data-driven approach in their organization? It, it, that's a good question. I, I personally think it's just um, <laughs> to, to, to get to that level of to get that level of sort of maturity. Um, it's you know, there, there's a maturity model when it comes to sort of being data-driven, right? Yeah. There's you know companies that have some basic data reporting, reliant on kind of the vendors dashboards and things like that to kind of lead the way, which is fine. That's okay. I think that where you kind of cross that chasm is where you actually start to do that integration. So, you know, if we were reliant on our vendors dashboards, we could certainly tell a lot of information about how effective that rollout was. But by actually adding that data to some of the other information that we have, like from our practice management system and things like that, we can actually start to get those insights of saying like, oh, well, you know, based on this, we can see that based on um, the difference between new patients and existing patients, booking appointments online, we see a different type of behavior. We also see a different type of profile. Um, and that only happens whenever we integrate the data. So, I mean, the short answer is it requires a, the DSO would really be required to invest in kind of that engineering team, you know, to actually sort of do the work and not sort of outsource it or rely on their vendors. I think that, you know, as I've, as I've sort of been in healthcare for a few years now, I do see a higher propensity for, you know, CIOs and companies to invest in the platforms and partner with a lot of their really good um, vendors. But I don't always see the, the, um, the appetite to sort of invest in engineering teams because, you know, it's, it's a relatively traditional business. We're not typically thinking of anything like high tech or kind of going outside of um, how the business has been traditionally run per se. Um, and, and frankly, a lot of the vendors provide great solutions with reporting. So there isn't always a need to do that. Um, so I think it's a, it's a conscious decision. It's a conscious investment. Um, it's honestly what attracted me to this particular company, North American Dental Group, because they did value, you know, sort of a culture of data-driven decision-making. They just didn't have all the tools in place before I got there, kind of orchestrate some of those things. Um, but I think the challenge is just making that conscientious decision to be able to do that. And look, it's an investment and it, and it pays off after, it takes time for it to pay off. And some of these principles aren't always well-defined in terms of like how we kind of build some of these models and things like that. Um, unlike other industries where, you know, like in retail, having a customer database is just a given, right? Yeah. In dental, not so much. Well, certainly just, you know, even looking at the dummy data with you today, um, I feel like North American Dental Group is obviously set up for success and perhaps other ways DSOs are not just by having someone in your role um, and obviously the team that you built there. And I appreciate you saying that. And, I, you know, I, I can't take credit uh, at all. I think that the team that I have that I get the opportunity to work with has been amazing, you know, just in terms of very talented, bright sort of, um, developers and engineers. Also, I, I have to sh you know, give the credit to um, you know, the rest of our executive leadership team for having faith and confidence in, in continuing to make the investments in, in innovation and clinical innovation. Um, that's what inspires me. That's what kind of brings me back. That's what brings everybody else back. Because if they if they didn't, I think that it, we you know we would be a little bit behind the times. And you know, we think about even the competitive workforce and market. Everybody from you know um, front desk managers to dentists. People want to work at a company that invests in clinical innovation. You know, we have dentists coming out of school who are using all of the latest, you know, lasers and 3D printers and AI radiograph technologies. They don't want to go and work for a company that isn't investing in those types of technologies because it doesn't isn't going to help grow their career. You know, our company is fortunate enough where we, we're making those investments. You know, so you know, in my role, in addition to some of the data strategy, which we talked about a few minutes ago, I'm also responsible for helping to support, roll out, and align on rolling out our you know, AI platform um, for radiograph overlays. That's something that's extremely exciting. You know, 3D printers, you know, um, panoramic uh, X-ray machines, and sort of all the latest technology. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm extremely grateful that you know, we have a, a, an executive leadership team who sees progress and investment aligned, and I'm also extremely um, grateful for the engineering team that helps to sort of um, you know, lift us up every day, too. So I take no credit for any of these things. You should take maybe just a little bit. Um, <laughs> Dan, we're at the 29 minute mark. Um, I do want to ask one last question, um, which is just, you know, any last second, last thoughts, last advice um, that you have for other folks at DSOs in the dental industry to maybe start embracing a little bit more of that data driven approach that you've brought to North American Dental Group. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it, Alec. And you know what? I, I think that what I would say is, um, 
you know, a, a lot of people think of innovation and AI and as sort of this all-encompassing thing, right? That sort of like boils the ocean in a heartbeat. That's not what it is. It's much more precise. And you can start small and make huge, huge strides. I mean, everything has an 80-20 rule in terms of value provided. I go back to my original sentiment, which is, you know, keep it simple and keep it explainable. Because what we're really talking about here is communications. Sure, it's communications via technology, but it's human communication. If I can't con communicate effectively to somebody about either any of these things, the high watermark or a patient score, it wouldn't be used. You know, the fact that it would be completely um, ineffective. So, I mean, I go back to my original mantra, which is keep it simple, make it explainable. If I can understand it, anybody can understand it. <laughs> I think it's a great lesson, not just for dental, but, you know, uh, I I'd go as far as any industry. For sure. <laughs> uh, Dan, thank you so much for doing the show, coming prepared, showing the dummy work. Um, honestly, it was one of my favorite episodes, just walking through all the data with you. So thank you so much for joining today. Thanks, Alec. I appreciate it. It's, it's really my pleasure and uh, appreciate all the help and, and look forward to talking more soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Thanks.